they say in Texas, howdy. It's a privilege to be here today. And I know you guys have picked this already, so let's just go ahead and cut to the chase. Who thinks I'm too old to be in school? <laughs> 35, I think it's 33, 30, something like that, years ago. I remember my wonderful bride, uh, her name is Carl. She's not able to be here today. She's spring break in Texas as well, so she's on her way up with two of my grandkids to visit her father and brother, her brother and sister-in-law up on a farm in central Oklahoma. Uh, farmers are a wonderful thing. Uh, wheat and cattle, uh, one for hamburgers, or meat, you wouldn't have it. I guess that's what really meat is. <laughs> uh, again, greetings from South Texas. Uh, I pastor at East Lake Fellowship Church. Uh, small church, church down there, down south, um, while I'm continuing or finishing my doctorate in biblical counseling, uh, will be done this year, thank you Lord Jesus. That's what I did mainly yesterday in the little room, but not in the little room, in the room that I was able to stay in, and my laptop is my best friend. Sometimes I want to throw it against the wall, sometimes it wants to throw me against the wall, but we're almost done. And thank God for that. This is the second opportunity that I've got to participate in uh, Revive the Nation through Southwestern. It will probably be my last. I will be done. I will be done. Somebody tried to talk me to do my PhD as well, and I, I thought about it and signed up for it. And as I'm finishing this, it's called a doctor's ministry, is what I'm doing now. As I'm completing it, i got to be insane to want to do it again, right? So, probably not. All right, but God, He works in mysterious ways. Uh, so that kind of leads me to uh, I'm going to say something else. Now. See, that's what happens when you get older. I have a 20 or 28 year old and a 33 year old. So that means you can be my son. That's weird, right? All right. I've got five grandchildren, four grandsons, one granddaughter. And she is the apple of life, mother of death. I love them all, but there's something about a little girl. All right. Until they grow up. <laughs> <laughs> and my, both of my daughters want to live look down the street from us with my three grandchildren, three grandsons. And uh, we, had, we kind of rescued my daughter from a, an abusive situation in Colorado. That's why she lives with us just down the road. Lived with me for the last 11 months. And that was telling me, I love my daughter. You know where I'm going. I love her death. But you got to go. <laughs> love her. You know, she comes over every Sunday. We have meals together. And uh, grandkids are all over the place. But the good thing about being a grandpa or a papa is that you can spoil them and you can sit them home. And when you're sitting there, <laughs> when you're sitting there and they're, and you, this happened the other day. My daughter said, Dad, I'm going to. My kids are annoying me, aren't they? No. What makes you think that? And when they leave, my wife looks at me and I look at her and she says, no, this isn't that quietness. Isn't it great? Yeah, so it's wonderful, but uh, it's good. it was good to, that you guys put me up in your, at the, what do you call that place? That's it. That's it. And then they invited me over. We went knocking on doors Friday or Saturday. Yes, Friday. That was, that was enjoyable. Enjoy doing that. And then uh, they invited me over for some homemade stew, and my, my total life, you're a great cook, babe, but this stew is the best. <laughs> she knows I don't like tomatoes. I'm, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but tomatoes are, they might be in heaven, they might. <laughs> they don't agree with me, but anyway, besides the point. Anyway, I want you to turn your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Colossians. Uh, he told me that I got an hour and 45 minutes. Is that right? No. I'm 50. Oh, no. I'm long-winded, but I'm not that long-winded, all right? I'll try to get it done in uh, under 30 minutes. But if I go over, it's just what preachers do. <laughs> all right? You guys awake? Yes. Last night I went to bed. Normally, I'm like your pastor. I go to bed about 8.30. Well, I got interested in this movie about asteroids. <laughs> Destroying the earth, right? And the next thing I know, it was 10.15. I'm like, oh my goodness. 
Then I couldn't go to sleep. Then I realized that I've already lost an hour. That kind of made me mad, you know? But anyway, Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 5 through 11. And I believe it is up on the screen, right? Okay, there we go. Chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. It says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them. But now, you must put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is not grief in you, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. We bow to you and pray. Father, God love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to be in Katie's, Kentucky today with these wonderful folks. Lord, I just ask you now that if there's one person today who has never accepted their, uh, as you as their personal Savior, whether they're here or whether they're watching via the Internet, Father, we just ask you to speak to their hearts and allow them to know that they need you. They need your Son who died on that cross for the entire for the sins of the entire world. Help us with this next few minutes as we're together, Lord, that our minds will be receptive to your word. And that we can apply it to our lives. And when we leave this building, we will be a different person than when we walked in here. We give you the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of Colossians, you'll see that Paul, especially here in chapter 3, verses 5 through 11, he's speaking metaphorically. In this passage, Paul is writing to the church of Colossae. And he's given three imperative commands. Commands in the Greek means it's, it's really important. When God gives you a command, you are to follow that really without question. Isn't that correct? So the question really arises from the text here in verse 5 where he says, I want you to put it to death. When he says put it to death, that means to do what? That means to bury it. We're going to discuss that here in a little bit. What Paul's saying is by putting something to death, he is saying to you, he's not saying to go out and kill somebody. That wouldn't be a very good thing, would it? Especially not today. That would be very bad. What he is saying is that some of you may fall out, some of you may fall out of your chair when I say this, so hopefully you don't get hurt. But no matter how much you enjoy the sin of your life, sin is enjoyable. Did you realize that? It's enticing, it's beautiful. It's because if it wasn't so beautiful, you wouldn't be doing it. You say, Brother Russ, it's natural. It is a natural thing. But what he's talking to the church of Colossae here is that he loved them so much, Paul did, that he was telling them, do not go back on what you once did. We are to bury our sins. We are to exterminate them. We are to destroy our sins. But what does the Christian do? A lot of times we revert back to what was in our comfort zone. We call ourselves a believer. We call ourselves a Christian. We call ourselves a believer in the faith, but we revert back to our old ways. And you wonder why some people today say that Christianity or the church is full of hypocrites. You know, they're right. The church is full of hypocrites. I'm a hypocrite. That wasn't in my notes, so I really don't know how to explain that. <laughs> you know, uh, we're all hypocrites because we're all sinners saved by grace. All right? The meaning of all this is that we must regard it as dead. We must get to the root of it, the root, uh, or root it out of your life and exterminate it in a way uh, that God is pleased. So let me explain it this way. Paul is telling the church here, here that the acts that you have done earlier in your life are no good to you or to God. When you ask the Lord to, to come into your heart, into your life, you, he, are, he automatically deleted them. He automatically buried them for you. And Jesus, like no other, like 
you and I, we, we end up, what, remembering our sins, especially when we're in our argument with someone. We bring up the past. And the past sometimes hurts people, especially when we bring it up with our tongue. Correct? Correct? Paul wrote this letter for them to put the bad stuff, to get rid of the bad speech, to get rid of the lies that we sometimes say, even to our family. He gave us his word. He gave us so great a salvation. He gave us his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins so that we would have everlasting life with him. The sins that clutter your body and my body needs to be taken off and shredded into a paper shred. All right? Not to be remembered no more. Why is it that we, again, we bring up the past to destroy our, our, our loved ones, our wives, our husbands, or our children. When God himself forgave us of our sins and buried them, he says, sin, go and sin no more. So the question is asked, why is Paul so adamant about us putting this kind of stuff to death? I'm glad you asked that question. So I'm going to give you an answer. So I want you and I just briefly this morning, I got three points and we're going to be done. But I want us to go on a little bit of a journey in the mind of Paul. Of all the characters in the Bible, Paul has to be my favorite. Because here he says, I'm a chief of sinners. I kind of fall into that category. I never murdered anybody. I wanted to sometimes, but I never did. Hypothetically thinking, all right? I'm just joking. Don't go and say, this guy wants to kill somebody. All right? But there are three important commands I want to give you that relate to verse 5. Number one is, we are to put our sins to death. Again, verse 5, it says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, and evil desire, and covetousness, which he says is what? Is idolatry. We must put it to death. You cannot do the things that you did before, before you came to know the Savior. It's not, it's, it's not healthy in your relationship with Jesus. He tells you to stay away from sexual immorality. This will destroy you. We're going to talk about a guy here in just a moment that just almost destroyed his ministry. Impurity, passion, which is uncontrolled sexual urges, evil desire, which is, uh, which is the evil of self-centered desire. We talk about the word covetousness, which is idolatry. I don't know about you, but living in Missouri, mainly in Texas where I'm at now, everybody's got to have a pickup truck, right? Cowboy boots and a pickup truck. Hot dogs and Chevrolet <laughs> or something like that, right? But I remember years ago, I wanted a Dodge Ram pickup, and I would have pretty much done anything to get that truck. This is living in Kansas City. I thought about it. How am I going to get my Dodge Ram? How am I going to do this? How, you know, I'm going to save for it. You know, and I never really got it in, in my 20s. Never got it in my 30s. Towards the end of my 40s, the Lord allowed me to have a Dodge Ram. That's what I'm driving right now. Hallelujah. Those who drive a Dodge Ram pickup will be first in heaven. It says it, it, says it in my Bible. I'm just kidding. Right? But every time I looked at one, I began to covet. And the Bible says right here, do not covet. Now, I know that's a funny little example, but there may be things in your life this morning that you yourself are coveting. Your wife doesn't know, your husband doesn't know, your children don't know, your mom and dad don't know, your, your neighbors, your co-workers, they don't know. But there's something that is blocking you from your faithful walk with the Lord, which falls into the territory of what? Idolatry. Anything that you put before God is what? Idolatry. It could be your job. It could be your family. It could be your finances. It could be your Dodge Ram pickup. It could be anything, and it, it will destroy your relationship with God. And that's what Paul was so adamant about the Church of Colossae. He didn't want them to go back and reminisce and live the way that they once did. You are to bury it. You are to, to desecrate it. You are to destroy it. I remember back in 1987, that's when I graduated from high school. 
that following summer, no, let me rephrase it, that following, that fall, I enrolled in Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, which is where I met the love of my life, which will be celebrating 34 years of marriage here in a couple weeks. Hallelujah. Pray the Lord. <laughs> all right, I remember, March 25th, I remember, all right? But there's a man by the name of Jimmy Swagger. He may ever hear that guy before. I've been to a couple of his crusades when I was younger. Loved his music, loved his preaching, still do today. Even though I'm Southern Baptist. That's okay like others, right? Okay. But he did something back then, and the Assemblies of God headquarters is located in Springfield, Missouri, where I went to Bible college, which was an independent Bible college back then. Brother Swagger, now I still, uh, no, he's still in Baton Rouge today, I believe, as still preaching effectively. But he did something back then that, if you all remember, fell into sin, not once, but, not, but twice, in the same situation. That broke my heart. It broke a lot of people's heart. It broke a lot of trust in people who followed this particular man in his ministry. Well, what happened to him could happen to anybody. He took his eyes off the Lord, and he began to indulge in sin and stuff that maybe has happened in, in the past. Instead of burying it, instead of shredding it off, putting the paper shredder, or instead of taking the clothing off, the t-shirt that he wore, uh, theoretically speaking, or metaphorically speaking. What happened then is that he, he broke the trust. God and, 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 and rather mainly of people. In, in, in the fall, or three years from that time, the assemblies of God threw him out of the denomination and he began, his ministry began to suffer. What would happen if he would have done something just a little bit differently and trusted God completely and buried those particular sins, especially the first time Then it happened again? He said, why are you judging him? I'm not judging him because I still love him. Him and I still pray for him. But the fact that it could happen to you, what happened to him could exactly happen to, to, to you, to you, and to me, right? Paul is saying here to the Colossi, uh, church at Colossae that these five vices that we just read here in verse 5, um, and some that are not mentioned in verse 5, are all about men, not about it says in chapter 3, verse 1, to seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Mr. Swire sought the things above at that time. If he would have done it at that time, we wouldn't be having this conversation. But Paul's concern here is that he cared about them so much that he did not want these things to happen to the people that he loved. Knowing your pastor like I do now, he has that kind of love for his flock. It's not easy being a pastor. And it's not, we talked about this at our house the other day. It's not easy being a pastor's wife either. He tells them, you don't need these things. The things that you think you need in life. You need food, you need shelter, and you need clothing. We don't need all these fancy, fancy stuff. Some of them are good to have. But we don't need those things. The lies. The sexual immorality, all these vices that are mentioned here in uh, Colossians 3, we don't need. We need to bury them. All right? We are human. We're going to have, the men's going to have those tendencies to look. But the Bible says don't act upon them. You see what I'm saying? And if you act upon them, you've already, what, you've already committed uh, lust, you've already committed adultery, and so forth. But I want you to look on uh, verse 6 again, if you will. He says, on account of these, the wrath of God is what? Is coming. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming, which in the Greek language means perkamai. <coughs> it means to come or it means to arrive. Okay? The sons of disobedience. Have anybody ever heard of that phrase before? Sounds like a good biker, uh, a biker's gang, a gang of bikers, whatever you want to call that, right? The sons of disobedience means those who do not, those who do not obey God. It means those who reject the gospel. If you're here today, or you've been here before, if you're listening, and you've rejected the gospel, you're known as the sons of, dis excuse me, the sons of disobedience. Those who oppose God. 
We see that in all over the world, especially in our government today, do we not? Those who oppose God's law. So let me ask you this question. What does the wrath of God mean to you? Does it mean that he's going to put you over his knee and give you a spiritual spanking? Sometimes we deserve that. These are the sins that provoke God's wrath down upon us. God's wrath comes down because of man's willful disobedience to sin. Our nature, we are born to sin. It's fun to sin. It's like overindulging in a big cheesecake. I don't know about you, church, but I love cheesecake. And don't put all that stuff on top. Just give me plain cheesecake. Unless you go to the cheesecake factory. You ever, anybody ever been there? You all sin when you go there, don't you? I know I do. Especially the, the kind. This is not my notes, so I don't have notes. Uh, red velvet cheesecake. Oh, hallelujah. That yeah, is so good. Get me hungry right now. All right? But Jesus tells us to be what? Holy, just as he is holy. God set the bar high, didn't he? It's hard to be holy. But when we go back and we do the things that we did before, God's saying that you're not being holy. It's hard to be holy in a world that we live in today, a world that's full of diversity, that so much anger, so much hatred. I talked to somebody on the phone yesterday. They called me, and they, they were just hateful, bitter. That's when counseling, that's why I'm getting my doctorate is in counseling, because everybody's healing spiritually. You may have been coming to this church for, and this is what, 20 something years that it's been in existence. Everybody's struggling with something. But yet we hold on to it and we don't bury the hatchet, so to speak. A man in my church years ago, uh, when I was passing up in Diamond, Oklahoma, the panhandle, which is nothing out there except for uh, dust and wind and uh, tumbleweed. That's a story for another day. A man in my church came to me and says, Brother Russ, he says, I've, you know, I've been in jail several times. I've made meth or I've sold meth. I've made it, done all that kind of stuff. I've gotten women pregnant. I've done all this bad stuff. And I'm very, I, he says, I don't want that kind of life anymore. I said, what you need to do is you need to bury it. You need to shred it. You need to bury it and get rid of it because God's already forgiven you if you've already asked him. How many of us would say, man, this guy is disgusting. This guy, is, he's weird. He, he, he doesn't belong to church, which I disagree because the church is made for the who? The sinners. The sinners. I call it the hospital. It's made for the sick, not just for the righteous. You say, would you allow certain people, homosexuals and stuff, into your church? Absolutely. Now, notice I did not say to serve. But the church is, the, uh, is here for those who are sick spiritually. And who are we to stick our nose up at them and say, huh, we're better than you. That's where the hypocrites come in right there. We can't be hypocritical. We've got to have these doors open for anybody who walks through those doors and needs the Savior of the world. Colossians 3, verse 7. In these you too once walked when you were living in them. What's he saying? Paul was telling them, do not forget that you yourself once walked in the mud of sin. Following the ways of the world rather than the ways of God. He said, you all once walked among the sons of disobedience. Who has been like their pagan neighbors. What we fail to do. We fail to do three things. Number one is that. Years ago I used to be a bus driver. For, for, a, for a public school. Boy was that experience. <laughs> but they teach you. In that CDL manual. Is to when you go to a railroad crossing. <coughs> you need to stop. Of course. No kidding right. right? You need to slow down. And you need to pull on your flashers, open your door, and there's a thing, they, three things. You stop, of course. You look. And what's the next thing? You got it. You listen. But 
But I think that's the antidote right there where we forget in our lives and we don't listen to the scripture. We don't listen to what God is saying because where our minds are blinded to other things of this world and God says, I can give you the warning signs right now to, 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 to just chill out and to get rid of the old stuff. I can't bless you if you're holding on to the old things of this world. And that's a tendency we all have to be doing. We need to stop. We need to look. And we need to listen to something that we all should be doing. But Paul is saying in verse 7, he says he's talking about living in them. He's, he's telling them that you Colossians once lived in them and you enjoyed them. And Paul's concern for his people or for that church ought to be the same concern that we have for each and every person in here, in my church, back at home, in churches all over the world. Good old Paul, who said that he was the chief of sinners. He knew firsthand what sin was and how it continued, or if it was to continue into your life, it would destroy your personal relationship with God. He said, you have to put it to death. Anybody here ever mow your yard? No kidding. What kind of a question is that? <laughs> I remember as a youngster, part of my job was doing the dishes and all that kind of jazz, and then also to mow the yard. I love mowing the yard because it got me away from mom and dad, amen? It got me out and about, put my little headphones or my back then they had them things you put a tape recorder in and a Walkman. That kind of brings it back to the day, doesn't it? All right. We didn't have earbuds and stuff back then. I remember mowing the yard. I remember uh, back then we also had what you call clotheslines. Do they still have those? <laughs> Boy, when mom put the sheets out there and I got to sleep on that night, all that smells so good. It smells great. But I also learned that during the summertime, there are things that like to climb inside the clotheslines. They got the big old head holes. I'd always look inside them as a kid, never saw anything. So I was mowing it, and, and the lawnmower of all places decided to hit one of them holes. What do you think flew out of there? Oh, Got things from things from the pits of hell, right? <laughs> Wasps got getting bigger around. Not one, not two, not three, a bunch. So what do you think I did? Do you think I started preaching and or, or started singing? Let's have a choir with these guys. No, I ran. <laughs> I ran far. I ran hard. I ran to the house and said, you're going to run after me. I said, I'm going to play Terminator. <laughs> Wish you if I could. But I would have got this can of rage. It was a full can. When I got done with him, there was nothing left. Yes, I exterminated the little creature. I'm still, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God, why did you create these little things? You know what God's going to say? To bug you. <laughs> God does have a sense of humor, all right? He says, he says, but my goal with all that was to put them to death. Verse 8, but now you must put them away. Your anger, your wrath, your malice, your slander, and all your obscene talk from your mouth. What do you think Paul's talking about here? I'm a believer in Jesus. Amen. I go to church every Sunday, but I use the F-bombs and the S-bombs and all them kind of bombs during the week. What if your co-workers hear that? What if your family hears that? What if a neighbor who you've been trying to witness to and they, come and they see you in church? You're going to think, that's a hypocrite. It says, if, if you can talk like that and I talk like that, why should I be a believer? You see, when we don't bury those things and they invest in our heart, then guess what? That's what we become. That's what we talk. And, and, and I've been there, so I'm not trying to preach the choir, okay? I used to have a filthy mouth years ago. Believe it or not. I had a good thought. It just went by way. When you get over that. Um, anyway, if I can, I'll think about it. I'll get back to it. Number two, verse eight. It says, we must bury our sin. In verse eight, Paul puts forth another imperative that you must put them away. Why do you think he would say that? The word but now, the phrase but now, refers to the present state of the Christian. 
Paul is reminding them that you are no longer living in these sins. You are to bury them, get rid of them. What great care and compassion that Paul has for his church. See, this signals a return to what we were discussing earlier when Paul was addressing them by comparing them to the sons of disobedience. Church, I don't want to be considered or labeled as the sons of disobedience. I want to be labeled, if I can use that word loosely, I want to be labeled or titled as a follower and a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. I believe if I was asked you that, each and every one of you would say the same thing. You say it's very hard and it's very difficult to put those away. It is. God didn't say it was going to be easy. But what he did say was, it's a journey. I always tell people when I'm counseling with them, is that it's not how you start the race. It's how you finish the race. Amen? What does Paul mean by put him away? He says, don't drift back to your own self. One of my favorite chapters in, or books in all the Bible, practically they're all good. They're all wonderful. But 1 Corinthians always has to, when, when Paul says, and I believe it's in chapter 11, where he says, Paul put the old things, old things have passed away, all things become new. We come back to the story of Mr. Swagger. He had to learn the hard way. In a way that reaching back to the life that he should not have been reaching would soon lose the trust of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. What he did, and as we discussed earlier, what he did was that he didn't put him to death. Again, this morning, there's something maybe that you're struggling with in your own personal walk with God. And God knows your heart. I don't. It's none of my business. You may be struggling here or something. Maybe it is with your salvation. Maybe it is with your finances. Or maybe you're having struggling in your, in your marriage today. God knows that. Speak to him. Tell him what it is. Don't bury it. Work it out together. You know, he goes on to say here is that also to put away anger. Folks, I, I can't even begin to tell you how many times that I've canceled young couples or I've canceled uh, even singles who are a lot of it comes to be angry or anger. It's okay to be angry in a spiritual way because Jesus himself got angry spiritually, but he did not react in the flesh. All right? And that's where you got to be careful. When you get angry, you get mad. The other person gets mad. The other person gets madder. You get madder. And so forth. And guess what? It's like a volcano. It's going to erupt. And then what you say in an argument is that you begin pulling the things of the past, as we discussed earlier, and it does what? There, now there's a rift between you and her, or him and him, whatever. That's great. Paul says to stay away from that. Stay away from anger. He says, put away rage, which means to, uh, to lay aside the actual energy of putting into words or deeds. He says, uh, 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 which, which is evil and will hurt somebody. He says to lay aside slander, which is a part of malice, which you put into effect. He says to put away filthy language. There we go with that again. We don't need to talk like that. It should even enter our minds. I work part-time at a place to help pick from up schools called Canyon the Eagles here uh, just a, every once in a while up there. And boy, you, you walk through that kitchen, and I think, why am I doing this? I was asked to help them because I'm good with people. I like talking. So when you're bringing the guests, I don't have a problem doing that, obviously. But every other word is, you know, I mean, I can. You begin to hear it, and then you begin to what? Hear it or say it? I remember when I was a truck driver. I did that for about 14 and a half years. All over Canada, all over the United States. Uh, you name the place, I've probably been in there. Uh, I've also been to Katie's. Several times, and as I got to Oak Grove, and I'm not going to tell you the story now, I was, I was hit by lightning and a tornado, scared the. So when we were driving from uh, from the airport back up to here, we drove down Liberty Lane on I-24, and I was that, that's uh, I'll never forget that. But God has a way of working wonderful things. He said, 
you're going to go to <laughs> you're going to Kentucky, which is I thought was pretty ironic. That's pretty funny. But according to Reader's Digest, in December seventh of two thousand two, they said profanity and crude language are becoming more and more car uh, common on a prime time television show. That was in two thousand two. Today, my wife, I don't know about you ladies, she's a Hallmark nut. So when that happens, I try to leave the room and watch the weather channel or something. <laughs> then she got me hooked in. I'll come in there and all of a sudden and I'm hooked. She said, You're hooked, aren't you? I said, Don't don't just dis- <coughs> not until we finish the show. Until they started doing things on that show that broke my heart. Allowing the homosexuals to come in and man, well, I told my wife we can't watch that anymore. What am I gonna do now? She said, <laughs> What am I gonna do? Now please, I'm not preaching on that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. I'm just a messenger. Alright? That's what you can do differently. I know what my family and I do, and we just, we just watch more football. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. That's another subject for another day. But it dishonors God, and it degrades men and women when we use that kind of language. Paul's telling the church of Colossae, don't go back and do that. Ungodly language creates an immoral and unspiritual atmosphere which is hostile to clean thinking and, and living. And I like this... Uh, I don't have his last name, but he goes by Dennis J. Here's what he said. He said, and I quote, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That prayer is needed today more than ever. A form of anger that we all heard and saw on social media a few years ago is that, that it's, uh, it, was, it was on the, the new channel. It was called uh, the Church of Christ in White Settlement, Texas. When a man got so upset in the middle of service and started shooting people. And you say, why would people do this? I don't know. But this particular man got up and started shooting people because he was giving money, or he wanted money instead of the food for the food pantry. So he started blowing people away. Just because he did not get what he wanted. In the Bible, behavior is often linked to what? Garments. It is no good if it does not glorify the Lord God. Paul says that we need to rip it off our bodies and throw it in the deep blue sea. We need to get it off our backs. We need to shred it and destroy it that particular shirt or that clothing. Is that my time? No. <laughs> I remember back in the, in the early 80s, this is how long this TV show had gone on. I still think it's going today. Anybody know the Simpsons? Calabunga, dude. You know, you know Bart? All right. I remember back then when I was in middle of high school, I remember our school, this is a public school, a class of 404 people in my senior class. I remember them. If you wore a Bart Simpson shirt to school, you immediately went to the, the principal's office and you had to turn it inside out. But yes, what I'm saying. I'm thinking, why? Well, I know now why. All right? Very disgraceful to the family. Maybe funny, but it's very disgraceful to the family. And God honors and uplifts the family. But my point is, look what they've done back then to what's being left out today in the school district. Now, don't get me wrong, people. I know 90% of you work in the school district. <laughs> I understand that. My wife works in the school district, too. And if you're sitting here today and you're a believer and you're working in the school district, that's a mission, that's a mission field. I understand. And I don't know if I could even do what you're doing and uh, so on. That would be hard. So my hat's off to you. So, Matt, Brother Matt said he will give you an extra $100 if you work in the school district. I have to sure you can see him, all right? So how do we do this?
how can we just put away these things that begin to clutter our wall? That leads me to point number three. I'm good. Number three is we must speak the truth. This is this is uh, the main thesis, if I can use it that way, in the biblical counseling ministry or uh, biblical counseling realm is always speak the truth in love. Sin is sin, and you can't sugarcoat it. When you're counseling with somebody, I don't know why I'm saying this, but when you're counseling with somebody, you can't say, well, that's just what the world thinks, whatever. You, as a biblical counselor, you have to say what it is. Adultery is sin. Blah, blah, blah. It's sin. How do you expect that person to turn away if they continue doing the same thing over and over again? That's what Paul said. You realize biblical counseling started in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve, and who went to them? Not the snake or the serpent. God went to them and began to what? He began to cancel them because of the sin that they, that they partook of. The last command that Paul tells us here in verse 9 is when he says, do not lie to each other. Why would he say that to the Colossian church? Because he cared about their personal relationship with the Father. According to the New American Commentary, it says that this command speaks to more than just verbal language. It reads all about falsehood, whether by action or by words. Lying means being false in word, which includes one's promises. Lying was a common practice in his day. And it's no different today. For those of you uh, early Christian history or Christian, yeah, Christian church history uh, buffs, if that's the right word, there's a guy by the name of Augustine. Anybody ever heard of Augustine before? You don't care. Anybody? Augustine? All right. Augustine said this. When we regard for truth, or when regard for truth has been broken down or even slightly weakened, all things will remain doubtful. The truth is important. You ever hear the story about the man who cried wolf? Oh, yeah. There's a story of four high school boys who couldn't resist the temptation of skipping morning classes. Anybody else? Anybody here ever skip classes? No comment, right? <laughs> In the young people, no, I better not say that right now. All right. Each has been smitten with a bad case of spring fever, these boys. So after lunch, they showed up at school one time and reported to the teacher that their car had a flat tire. Much of the relief, she smiled and she said, Oh. Well, you missed a quiz this morning. So take your seat and get out a pencil and paper. This is a Still smiling, she says, and she waited as they settled down and got ready for the question. Here's what she said. The first question was, which, which tire was flat? Which tire was flat? What if each one of them said, is the right rear, the front rear, or the front, left? That, that, then they'd be caught in a lie, wouldn't they? Christians today are really no different in the world than the world. Paul says that the Christian uh, that says that the Christian community is to be characterized by truth and what? And faithfulness or truthfulness. It's imperative that we hold strong to what God's word says and let it be the light for our past. Psalms 119. 108, I think it is. Verse 108. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He says also in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but by me. That's a great salvation verse. But Jesus is the way. He is what? The truth. And the truth will set you free. The scripture is sufficient enough to, you don't have to be the greatest speaker. You don't have to be the greatest teacher. You don't have to be the great whatever. As long as you present God's word, the spirit will do mighty wonders of getting that point across. Number, uh, look at verse 10. He says, and have put on the new self with its practices. True or false question? You guys seem, you so smart people. Our conduct, our character, should mirror that of Christ. True or false? We say true. Then 
well, why don't we do that? Oh, that is the question. We are to put on the new nature, which is the life that Christ has planned for you. Jeremiah 29, verse 11. The knowledge that we get from Christ is an important part of our life in Christ. Believers ought to demonstrate compassion, humility, patience. That's a hard one. Amen? Patience, patience is a virtue. And forgiveness rather than, if you're going to put off something, you need to not just, how I've heard it said before, not to get rid of it, yes, but to replace it. You replace it with, with uh, rather than sexual immorality, impurity, passion, desire, and covetousness, you replace it with godliness, truthfulness, faithfulness. Right. Verse 11. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. All barriers are broken in Christ. All believers are made equal. Believers ought to do, to do the way with the old way. And start things fresh and new. Christ is all that matters. Christ brings people together with different nationalities. And the Bible says, Behold, and how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The church should be the place where God, people dwell, not to, not to, not, not what was the word, not to uh, do gossip, not to backstab, not to lie to one another, but to encourage, to uplift, and to have compassion. And to hug that particular person who might be struggling spiritually. No matter who we are or where we're at, we need to be all in unity. Him and I went to that, that place the other day. Good chicken wings, let me tell you. What was the name of that joint? River Barn? Burger Barn. River Barn. 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 It's still good. And he asked something that I usually do. He said, what can, ask the waitress, what can I do today? Or how can I pray for you? I think it's how she says something like that. And she, the lady said, world peace. I felt like I was in some pageant. World peace. <laughs> we all want world peace, but is, is it really going to happen during our lifetime? Probably not. But we can strive for that, right? When they say world peace, it's really... No matter who we are, where we're at, we all need to be in unity. These three imperative commands by Paul are very important instructions for you and I to live as new creations in Christ. Believers should not want to look, uh, look back and live the old life. You should not want to look back and turn into a pillar of salt. All right? The old sins may be enjoyable, but there's a reason why God is wanting you to discard them from your life. The hardest thing for me to go through is when God is molding me, pruning me, which, is, which it hurts. When you, when you prune a plant, you're pruning it. Why? Because parts of it are dying or you want the roots to be strong, right? And you want to grow. That's what God, he wants you to be rooted strongly in Scripture. He wants you to be rooted strongly in the, in the church. He wants you to be involved in the church, yes. But what he wants to do more is he wants to prune you and build you into his, in, into his image, into his likeness. If you do those com important commands, God will bless you and he will honor you for being faithful to him. This is to the unbeliever. You might be sitting here today or you might be watching via uh, internet, Facebook, YouTube, whatever it might be. If you were to die right now, where would you spend eternity? There's an old Southern Gospel song that says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. We build these things in our, our life, our job, our money, our, our retirement. Last time I heard or seen that you can't really take a purse with you to the uh, to the to the funeral home. You can't take it with you. But people have tried, believe it or not. Romans 5 8 says, For the wages of sin is death. You know what that means? Our sin is the Christ on the cross. We're the ones that put Jesus on the cross. Our sin
sins did that. Here in just a moment, we're going to sing a song. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seats if God has spoken to your heart. And you come forward, whether it's in your seat, but it's got, the Lord says always to make it public. You say, Brother Russ, I really need Jesus in my heart today. Right now. That's the greatest choice that you can ever make. But for the believer, maybe you're struggling with some sin in your life that is keeping you from being faithful to God. I don't know what it is, but God does. He knows what you're struggling with. And I pray with all my heart that if you're struggling with that, just give it to God. Turn away. Old things have passed away. All things will become new. I love new things. It's an exciting journey. But God did say it wasn't going to be easy in a matter of speaking. The Bible, well, my Bible doesn't say this either. But you remember the old commercial years ago? Coke, Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. I passed the test. I went to Coke. Amen? Coke Zero. Zero will be there. For those who don't like it, come talk to me after. But you made a choice. Remember, they did the blind, blindfold test, and you did blah 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 blah. This is some, kind of something like that. You have the choice now to either choose Jesus, or on the other coin, you have the the ability and the free will to choose the ways of the world, which leads to what. If you don't know Jesus this morning, you're on your way to hell. And you say, that's pretty drastic. And that's not what I'm saying. That's what the Bible says. God wants all of his children to be with him. He doesn't want to have to send somebody to depart from me. I never knew you. He doesn't want that. He wants all of his babies, all of his children to be together. Can you imagine not having your children with you? Can you imagine not having your mom and dad with you? Can you imagine not having your aunt and uncle wherever or your best friends or your co-workers with you when you're in heaven? But fortunately, that's the way it's going to be. But Jesus wants us to have one more, at least one more of his sheep to return to him and to follow him faithfully. Is that you today? Will you pray with me? Father God, we love you so much. I thank you again for the opportunity to Preach your word to these fine people. Lord, I don't know them. I don't know those who are watching. But I do know that you and the Spirit does, Father. I just beg you, Father, to allow your word and to allow your spirit to convict our hearts. Lord, this world is temporary. This world is not our home. I just pray for that one who is struggling, who is deterred, who's, who was afraid to, to, to shred the old self and live in still in the flesh. Help our, this world not to be a distraction from, from you, Father. Help us, the signs are there all over this world, all over our communities, Lord, that your, your time is near. Today is the day of salvation. I, I ask your spirit to be strong right now as we sing this song. That we give everything to you. We surrender everything to you, our Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. Stand up and sing.